as the praise team takes their final steps off the platform, let me, let me say this. I have never in my life known evangelism to be anything else except offered from the context of uh, emotion. I don't think that necessarily that's a bad thing, okay? So hear me on that. It can become a bad thing, though. Because, and I talked about this a little bit last week, but I'll say it again. I, I really believe that a lot of times the kind of um, Christian steps that we're taking are more undergirded with emotion than they may be faith. That's a bit troubling for me, okay? Now, don't hear me sitting here saying, most people's commitment to Christ is disingenuous. I'm not saying that whatsoever. In no way am I saying that. But growing up, my culture, even in a pretty reserved local assembly, emotion was kind of the driving force behind the whole thing. We, 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 we kind of moved when we were emotionally moved, you know? We were moved by maybe the magnitude of the event, the deeper I walk with Christ, okay, the more I'm recognizing that emotion is important. And you can't say that it's not because it's very important. When you look at Jesus' life, it's full of emotion, okay? But as I work with people over the years, okay, Christianity, genuine Christianity while it's not matter of fact, genuine Christianity can't be girded simply by emotion. That's hard because we want to get charged up every single week. But I'm telling you, the char what happens when the charge goes? And some of you will say, well, the charge should never go away. The Holy Spirit should always. Be. I understand that. I understand that completely. But it's emotion that drove Peter to say, let's stay up here forever. It's willfulness that had the father shut the whole thing down and say, this is my son, you listen to him. And they walk down from the mountain, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Hope this all makes sense. I want to talk about giving my life to Christ. What does that mean? What does it mean to give your life to Jesus Christ. My sister, my older sister Keely, just left this morning. Continue to pray for her. She's entering into her radiation treatments uh, as she continues to battle cancer. All right. Um, but we were talking yesterday, and Keely asked me about a certain person. I'm not going to tell you male or female. She asked me about a certain person, and I said, I don't know where that person is. And she said, why not? And I said, I tell people now, this is the help that I offer. If you're not interested in this, there's nothing I can do for you. Whew, that's hard, man. You think about that. And I'll meet people anywhere. Anyone that knows me knows that I will meet anybody anywhere. But I'm done dancing around this thing. The only thing that is going to genuinely change a life is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you don't access Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through anyone or anything else except Jesus Messiah. That's the only help I offer now. We can talk about morality, but at some point I'm going to look at you and say, we're wasting our time here. Because you're not interested in Messiah, and I'm not interested in offering anything else except Messiah. Whew, man, that's hard. And I'm not moving. This is the help that I offer. I offer Jesus Christ. Okay? I'm asking you, what does it mean to give your life to Jesus Christ? This has the potential to be a very sobering Sunday morning. See the title? I'm going to give you a list, 
and it could be a longer list. <laughs> Nine arenas where people said no. Before we take one step in that direction, I want you to get a hold of this. This is big. Because growing up in church, I kind of felt like God was against us. That he was kind of over here, and we had to do everything we could do to somehow get to God. Like, if I got lucky, I might make it to him. That God was somehow way out there in the distance, and if I could kind of pilgrim, pilgrim's progress, navigate the world, I might find myself at Jesus of Nazareth. Can I tell you something? That's wrong, too. Do you know how much God loves you? You don't. I don't. I have no clue. Like, until I held Tanner in my hands, my oldest son, I really didn't have a frame of reference for how much my parents loved me. I didn't. I mean, you know your parents kind of like love you, yeah. When you hold your child in your hands, you're like, oh, oh, wow. Now think about what Jesus said. If you, I mean, this is Jesus. I'm not like making this up as I go along. Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more your Father in heaven? Do you know how much God loves you? God, our Savior, desires all human beings. That's huge. Everybody. Everybody. I noticed some public posts last week where people wrote after the service, ugh. Pastor Kevin said we had to be nice to people that we hate. <laughs> he died for them too. Do you see that? I, this, this is a statement that has blown my mind for a few years. Do you realize Jesus died for the people who were killing him? Let that settle into your life for a second. Jesus died for the people who were killing him. Man, God our Savior desires the people who were killing him to be saved. Goodness gracious. God, our Savior, desires for Annas and Caiaphas to be saved. Let me roll one out here, and you guys might write me emails about this. God, our Savior, desires Judas to be saved. Huh? How about this one? God, our, sa our Savior, desires, here we go, Ahab, if you know your Old Testament, God our sa Savior desires Ahab. No king did worse than Ahab to be saved. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see that all, most of those kings followed in the ways of King Jeroboam. God our Savior desires Jeroboam to be saved. God our Savior desires Jeffrey Dahmer to be saved. Ooh, okay, let's get really nasty. God, our Savior, desires Osama bin Laden to be saved. Ooh, not him. The depths of the depths of hell are reserved for him. That's not what that says. See, because that's where we qualify. Well, Chris is all right, but Osama bin Laden, no shot. You know? Daniel's grandma, special like Christian emeritus. But Saddam Hussein, nope, hell. Bound for hell. Bound for hell. God our Savior desires all human beings. How about this? Do me a favor. Put your name in the place of all human beings right now. If you're in this room, and you don't think you have a shot, put your name in there. God, our Savior, desires Leslie to be saved. Somebody needs to hear that today. Someone needs to hear that today. God, our Savior, desires Devin to be saved. Boy, that's special, isn't it? You're here for a reason. You're here because God loves you. And you know what I don't want you to do? I don't want you to say no. 
I don't want you to say no. I want you to say yes. God, our Savior. What's she call you? No, what's your made-up name you call him? Don't you call him by a name that's not his name? You're ruining this joke. This is a good <laughs> joke. Eh. You better honk at me in the morning when you drive by. God, our Savior, desires all human beings to be. See, that joke would not work at second service. This place is like daggone crickets at second service. I tried to tell some West Virginia joke three times last week, and they never even moved. They looked at me like, oh, my gosh. Right there, buddy. You got the point? Let's make a decision. Go ahead. God desires all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. If that's the reality, don't be among those who say no. Don't be among those who say no. Do you know what I think? Go ahead, fellas. Do you know what I think the single greatest sin in the church is right now? It's this one. It's this one. I believe this with all my heart. We're just living life. I was sitting with some people last night at a gathering, and this guy looked at me and he said, listen, I just think if I get up every day and I try to treat other people like I'd like to be treated and I'm good, it'll be okay. The coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Now notice what he doesn't say. Jesus doesn't say they were gluttonous drunks. They're just getting up and getting their coffee every day. They're just going to the giant eagle. That's what that says. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Okay, had a had a couple, had a guy this week come in, in his 70s, never been married before. I'd like to get married. That's pretty cool. Eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Just living life, man. Just living life. Our best life. I hear that phrase all the time, live your best life. What in the world does that mean? And Jesus says... And they didn't understand. I think part of this is my obligation to tell you, you need to understand. Life ain't autopilot. It's not autopilot. And where they missed it in the days of Noah, Jesus says it's going to be right like that when Jesus comes back. It's going to be like that. We're just going to be going about our business. It didn't say they were sacrificing to Baal. That's not what that says. It's, it's, it's Dunkin' Donuts. I made the donuts. You know? You know, remember that old commercial? Time to make the donuts. You know? My niece just started her first real job. She said, you can't live three days without water. You can't live three weeks without food. And you can't live three minutes without air. She said, I hate my job so much, I tried to hold my breath this week for three minutes. She said, I made it to a minute 45. Dag on. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> How many times have you heard the alarm go off and go, ugh. You just, but you got up and went to work because you got to pay your power bill. Jesus said there's people who are just living. And it's going to come and you're going to miss it. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Give your life to Christ. Go ahead. I keep my life while turning to Jesus as a grantor of wishes. Notice how this is phrased. Now, Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus. Why was Herod glad when he saw Jesus? Because he wanted to see him for a long time. Why did he want to see him for a long time? Because he'd been hearing about him. He was hoping to see some sign performed by him. Jesus is not a magician. Do you understand that? Jesus is not a magician. 
if you're approaching Jesus like he's a magician, don't do that. You might as well just say no to him. Don't approach him that way. Approach him with the utmost respect because he is the savior of the universe and not a grantor of wishes. Will he bless your life? Yes. 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark says, and these are the signs that will follow the believer. You shouldn't be surprised if some amazing thing happens in your life at the hands of our Lord. But don't go to him saying, would you grant me a wish? You might as well rub the lamp. That's not how to approach Jesus. Okay? I'm among those who receive from God and immediately return to life without genuine thanks. Ten lepers come to Jesus and say, could you do something about this? And Jesus said, I would be honored to do something about this. And as they walked away, all ten were cleansed. And as ten were walking away, one of them went, oh my goodness. Jesus, thank you so much. And Jesus says, weren't there ten of you guys? And the other guy goes, I mean, I guess. But I know I'm responsible. I'm responsible now that you've touched me to realize I've come to you with my life. And I asked you to do something for me. And if I truly believe in you, and not simply just what you can do, but I truly believe in you as Messiah, then I have to live a life of thankfulness before you. And Jesus says, you got it. You didn't say no. You said yes to more than just a healing. And you said yes to a life of thankfulness. I wonder how many lepers kneel here every week and are healed. I wonder how many lepers come to this corner and are healed. Isn't that, that, this, look here. This is what's happening here. This is the leprosy zone over here. And what I'm saying is, is not to say no to Christ. Because if you come here and your leprosy is healed, your move should not be, I'll come back the next time, and there will be a next time. It should be, you know what? I know there's going to be a next time. So my life is not going to be in sporadic requests for provision. My life is going to be lived in thankfulness. That's saying yes to Christ. Okay? Keep walking. Whew, this is a tough one. I've heard of the feeding of the 5,000. Remember that one? John the Baptist dies. Jesus says to the 12, we need to get away. There weren't just 12 disciples. There were many, many more disciples. At the end of Jesus' public ministry, there's 120. Many people believe there were a lot more than 120. 120, 70, 12, 3, 1. But outside of that, there were tons of people who were following Jesus. And things are getting really good. John the Baptist passes away. There's a punch to the movement. Jesus says to the 12, we need to get away. They go somewhere down in the south near Tiberias, it looks like. They're pulling away because Jesus' heart hurts. When he gets down there, and you just were there, it ain't that far. He gets down there, and when he gets there, like 12,000 people beat him there. He preaches to them all day. At the end of the day... They're all hungry. The disciples say, send them away so that they can go get something to eat. Jesus says, why would we send them away? You guys feed them. How are we going to do this? Shaggy, you know. See, you laughed at that. That was funny. That was a little Scooby-Doo joke there. You picked up on it. I will not do that at second service. They won't laugh. And you tell them I said, you better laugh at his jokes, on it. 
<laughs> I know I'm not funny, but I am a little entertaining. <laughs> kind of like the village idiot, you know. You just said yes you are when I said village idiot. <laughs> I don't call you out ever, Cheryl, in front of everyone. Cheryl Williams. And I'm posting this online this week. Nathan, you post this sermon this week. <laughs> All right, get it together. So Jesus takes the five loaves and two fish that they find from the kid, feeds them all, sends them away. Now this is where Jesus turns up the heat because the next day they are in Capernaum. And Jesus is now teaching in that synagogue where we stood, Daniel. Okay, He's teaching in that synagogue according to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. And Jesus seriously turns up the volume. Because all those people he fed the day before show up. And Jesus looks at them and says, the only reason you're here today is because I fed you yesterday. Where'd the compassion go? The day before, he's like, make sure everybody gets something to eat. Today, he's like, I'm not sure if I'm going to give you anything to eat at all. Because at this point, you're not following me for the right reasons. And they get nervous. And they go, okay, all right, all right. What do we have to do? To follow you. And Jesus says, it's not about doing, it's about being. This is the work of God that you, watch this, salvation, giving your life to Christ. He says that you believe in him whom he sent. If, you, if you're just looking to God for fish and bread, you're barking up the wrong tree. He only offers this kind of help ultimately. He says, I'm the bread of life. And then there's this beautiful monologue that he breaks into. And in that, he tells kosher Jews who for thousands of years were not allowed to eat the flesh of anything except that which God prescribed, and it had to have the blood removed from it, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me as a disciple, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What? And as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. In about five minutes, I'm going to talk to you about God in country. And some of you are going to be very angry with me. I prefer an interpretation of the scriptures that supports my lifestyle rather than the honest, deepening revelation of the Messiah. Gird your loins, because here it comes. When you prefer your version over the scripture rather than the truth of the scripture, that's saying no to Christ. You have to say yes. I picked this one on purpose. Looking at the rich young ruler, Jesus felt a love for him. Isn't that gorgeous? There's no one in the world. There's no one in the universe. There's no one in all eternity who wanted the rich young ruler to say yes more than Jesus. Nobody. The Savior wants the rich young ruler to come to Christ. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, only one thing you lack. Go sell all you possess, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me, come be my disciple. But at these words, the rich young ruler was sad. He knew it was right. He knew it was right, but he picked his stuff over God. People do that every day. People do that every day. Some of you call it stewardship. Do you know what it is? Idol worship. <laughs> it ain't stewardship. Well, God told me I needed to take care of this and take care of that. Yeah, but he told you also to let that go. Do you love your possessions, your property, more than the Messiah? If you do, 
You're saying no. Don't say no. This one hit me the hardest. I could have put the two thieves up on the cross, but it's Barabbas who's had a deep impact on my life. Can you imagine standing within feet of a bloodied, broken Jesus and Pilate standing there and saying, I'm going to let the Christ go. And everybody else is screaming, no, give us Barabbas. If you're Barabbas and you're within arm's length of the Christ, do you really hold to your own personal innocence when you know you're guilty as a dog? And then just walk away. And just walk away. Do you realize that happens in church every Sunday? People come in with a mask. Jesus says it's a thin veneer of soil, but underneath it's a rock. The epistles say it's people who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. I mean, I could keep giving you examples, but this happens all the time. It's human nature. It's the character of fallen humanity. We will look Jesus square in the eye and know he's the one that should be let go. And we go, nuts for you. And we walk away with a mask of innocence, but at the core of who we are, it's guilty as guilty as can be. And the right move there is to realize Jesus would never have walked away. He was going to the cross because we shouldn't walk away, and we need him. Barabbas' best move at that point is to go, you know what, you are innocent, and I'm guilty, but I know you're not going anywhere, and I'll die with you. That's giving your life to Christ. If, 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 just think about this. I don't know where Barabbas is. Maybe he made it. I don't know. Okay. Eternity was five feet away, and he chose his worldly innocence. You ready? Take a look at this. Because America is famous for God and country. It's kind of like an equal level, correct? You understand that's not a good thing. That's hard. Now, before you start lecturing me about Americanism and nationalism and how important it is, and I need to get up to snuff on things, I, I can walk you through my family history. My father is a Marine Corps veteran. One of the most impactful things of my life was standing at like, I think I was in the fourth grade, between the third and the fourth grade, and seeing the changing of the guard at Arlington Cemetery. That was powerful. My mother hauled me to every museum in the country. I can't tell you how early it was I was at Gettysburg. Randall, she was your teacher. My mom's all about that, ain't she? My dad is a proud Marine Corps veteran. Proud Marine Corps veteran, okay? When the national anthem plays, I stand. I take off my hat. I put it over my heart. So do not lecture me about America. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you put Jesus and the President of the United States on the same level, that is sin. That is sin. Daniel and James and I are on the Sea of Galilee with all the other pilgrims. I'm on the Sea of Galilee. What do you think the first thing those Israelis did when we got on the Sea of Galilee? Do you know what the first thing they did? They raised the American flag and played the national anthem. That was not why I went to Israel. And I stood, and I took my hat off, and I put it over my heart. And I prayed during the national anthem, and I said, Lord, this is not while I'm here, but I will respect it nonetheless. But make no mistake about it, my 100% allegiance is to you, my God and you, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And one day when the flags of all nations go down and we stand as one nation, tribe, and tongue, I will not be caught with we have no king but Caesar on my breath. So you think about that over your next election. You think about that. I'm going to think about it. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. For the last month, my morning prayer reading has said this. Every day, as long as this today lasts, Keep encouraging one another. We are the people of the Lord, the flock that is led by his hand. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Come, ring out our joy to the Lord. Hail the God who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks with songs. Let us hail the Lord. A mighty God is the Lord, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his. To him belongs the sea, for he made it in the dry land shaped by his hands. Come in, let us bow and bend low. Let us kneel before the Lord God who made us, for he is our God, and we the people who belong to his pasture, the flock that is led by his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah. As on the day at Massa in the desert, when your fathers put me to the test, when they tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was wearied of these people, and I said, Their hearts are astray, these people do not know my ways. And then I took an oath in my anger, Never shall they enter my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We are the people of the Lord, the flock that is led by his hand. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. I don't want to be like one of those people who had just walked through the Red Sea and they were on to Mount Sinai and they said, now listen here, even though you just performed 11 of the single greatest miracles in the entire world, 10 plagues, parting of the Red Sea, before we get to Sinai, I'm thirsty and I need a drink. That's what Mirabah and Massa are. It's looking at God and saying, what have you done for me lately? I forget God's past sustenance and possess no faith for present and future sustenance. At 5 o'clock in the morning, nearly every single morning, as I put my dogs out to go to the bathroom for the first time, I sit there and read those words from Psalm 95 and say, I don't want any part of myself this day to look to God and say, what are you going to do now, God? I don't want to be that person. I don't want to say no to the Messiah who I've put my faith in. Last thing. This is a tough one, too. I value tradition more than Messiah. I value tradition more than Messiah. Can I tell you something? If this building burns, I don't care. I do not care. If it caught on fire last night, we would still have worship somewhere this morning. Do you understand that? But Jesus said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. Pause there. Look, before 99% of you were in this room, I was in this room. 20 of us were there the third week. I know every tradition kingdom has ever had. And I have willingly said goodbye to some of them because I know where God is leading us. And I know for the last four years there have been rumblings in this room and out of it for some of the decisions that I have made. And I'm telling you, we're going in the right direction. 
I know there are many people in this room, and I'm just going to say it, who don't like the music. It's here to stay. Okay? So end of discussion. I don't want to hear about it anymore. And I don't want you to badmouth me anymore. We're moving forward. It's over. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been taught, brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. His disciples came to the point out the temple building to him, and Jesus said, Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. Do you realize Jesus went to the synagogue every single week, and when the disciples said, Wow, that's the greatest synagogue of them all, Jesus said, It will all be reduced to rubble. Because it's not about a building or the Cokesbury hymnal. It's about the Christ. Do you hear me? It is about the Christ. And wherever the Christ leads, we will go. Say yes to Jesus. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The state of a person's spirit is visible in the actions of the individual. We must surrender to Jesus Messiah and allow his spirit to live through us. We must not be among those whose actions say no to the Messiah. We must give our lives to Christ. I'm going to ask you to do that now. Do it by coming forward and receiving this sacrament by faith. Father, we love you and we give you praise. Thank you for this morning. I ask your blessing upon this place. We call one another to be people who walk on water. But it is a scary thing to throw your leg over the side of the boat. Jesus, I pray that as people come forward today, that they will declare that you are Lord as they receive this body of yours that you gave to us, that they will take and they will eat. They will declare and decree in remembrance of you. And I pray, Lord God, that they will take this cup and they will declare and decree that it is your death, your burial, your resurrection, your blood that you shed to wash us clean and bring to all of us rescue. Now, God, as you have brought us to it and stand us in the middle of it, I pray that every person in this room would surrender to the reception of the gospel of Jesus Christ and nothing else. Not to morality, not to their own way, but each and every one of us would surrender our lives to you, the one true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That is my prayer for everyone in this room today. Praise be to your holy name, Lord Jesus Christ. We love and give you praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. One movement. Come and receive and declare Jesus Christ as your Lord. Say yes to him.